Welcome to our study on the book of Romans. This is the Romans Education, part six. And this is session four. Because we only did three last time. Because y'all got me sidetracked. So I'm going to try to take right up where we left off last time. Let me try to introduce it by what I put on the board here. Um... As you come through the book of Romans, you understand that you are given an opportunity as an adopted adult son of your heavenly father to have his wisdom written on your heart. And actually, more than that, for you to become a godly creature. And that godliness, as we all know, is comprised of, get rid of that marker, is comprised of three parts First of all, the ability to think like our Heavenly Father. The second one is to live like our Heavenly Father. And the third one is to labor with Him in what He's doing. Those are the three components of godliness. Now, we confuse that word godliness with righteousness all the time. When somebody does good things, we say they're a godly person. And that may or may not be true because you can do a lot of good things and still not be godly. Uh, but, but my point is this, to th and by the way, let me differentiate here because some folks have a little bit of problem say, these seem really close. What's the difference between living like God would do it and laboring with Him? This, this really, you need to think about this. It's just really easy to think about godly thinking, godly living, and godly labor. That's just a way to concisely put it in your mind. To live means to do things His way. He has a way that he is doing things. And it is, that's the process. And the process is very, very important. In fact, if you miss the process, it won't, whatever you think you've gotten to at the end will not be the same thing that he wanted you to get to. And we'll talk about that, I think, in just a little bit, but just kind of have that in your mind. So, in order to get this education, and it really is an education. In order to get this, in order to start thinking about things the way your Heavenly Father does, and to start doing things His way so that you can actually labor with Him in what He's doing, not only now in this world, but later in the heavenly places when you get your glorified body, that those things have to be accomplished in you. So as you come through Romans 8, those first five chapters, he's talking to you about, among some other things, your justification, your eternal life. In Romans uh, 6, 7, in the first 13 verses of 8, he gives you the first two components of your sanctification, which is the process whereby you live for God on a daily basis. And then when you get into Romans chapter 8, verses 14 and 15, you run into the third component of your sanctification, which you are an adult adopted son. And you have to go back and remember that what biblical adoption is. Biblical adoption is not about, you know, God looking down and seeing some unfortunate orphan and just adopting them into his family. You were made part of the family of God with, as part of your justification. But in your sanctification, it's biblical adoption. And the, and the fact that you're adopted means several different things. And the first thing it means is you are now going to be treated as an adult not a child any longer. The second thing it means is, and by the way, and this is the way the Hebrews understood it, it's the way the Greeks understood it, it's the way the Romans understood it. In our culture today, we've lost that because when we think of adoption, we think of finding uh, a child for a couple that may not be able to have children that wants them. Or we see a child in an unfortunate situation and we want to give them a better life and, 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 and those kinds of things. There's nothing wrong with that. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not discrediting that. But when your Bible talks about you've been given the spirit of adoption, that's not what it's talking about, the kind of adoption we talk about today. Because what a father would do is look out among his own natural born children and he would look out and he would see which of those children he was going to train to one day take Take over the family business and carry it on. And one day look out among their own natural children and see which one of those would carry on the family business. Now, if there were no children or none of the kids were interested in the family business, then the father would look outside of his natural born children and he would find someone who did have that interest. He would bring them in. This was a legal arrangement that actually gave a son or daughter a stronger 
relationship in the family and with the father than just being a natural born child. Because while all of the children may get an inheritance out of the father's wealth, the adopted child got the business. They not only shared in the normal inheritance, they also shared in the, in the they didn't just share, they got the business. And so then they were responsible. Well, your heavenly Father has a business that He is going to accomplish in eternity. It's the reason He created mankind in the first place. It's the reason He created the heavens and the earth in the first place. All of that got derailed with, by sin. And now what God is doing is He's not just saving you so one day He can drag you off to heaven and you can do God knows what. Sit in your heavenly hammock and sip lemonade for all eternity. That may sound really good, but you would get really tired of that. Forever is a pretty long time. So what he has is, is he has something he's actually doing in eternity. And he has decided that he will include us not only in the doing of that, but in the glory of that as well. He is going to share that glory. And he's going to share the inheritance of his son. Jesus Christ, which is why in Romans 8, we are called joint heirs with Christ. You know what a joint heir is? It means they're sharing in that inheritance. And this is a pretty, this is a pretty um, uh, wild concept when you think about what kind of inheritance is the Son of God going to get, and you're going to share in that inheritance. But as that adult son, you are also, the next thing you're, you know is that you're given liberty to make your own decisions about what you're going to do because your Heavenly Father is not going to force you by punishing you or causing circumstances to arise in your life to make you do something. Part of being an adult is that you get to make your own decisions. When the kids move out, they get married, they start their own family, then you know what? You may see that they're not making some smart moves, but guess what? Now it's their moves to make. Now if they come to you and ask you about it, you can certainly tell them but you know, at the end of the day, you can't make them do anything anymore. And your father is not going to make you do anything. But he is offering us the greatest thing we have ever had the opportunity to put our hands to. And because of that, we have liberty to make all kinds of decisions and even to say yes or no to this opportunity he is extending to us. And so the last thing about being adopted is this, is that we are now going to be educated and trained in the business and you should expect and a, and a son who was adopted in the Hebrew culture that's what he would have expected when the father would come to him let's say that James was the son the father would come to James and he would say I'm thinking about handing over the, the family business to you are you interested and if he said oh boy am I interested here's what he knows that his formal education is about to end the tutors and governors get dismissed and now he's going to go to work with his father, and he's going to learn the family business from the ground up. Well, guess what? In Romans chapter 8, you are given the opportunity to say yes or no, because your father is telling you now, for the first time, I'm going to give you the opportunity to labor with me in my eternal business. And if you are not interested in that, you are sitting in the wrong place, because this is going to be awfully long. <laughs> But if you are interested in that, then he's going to give you an opportunity to have this last one take place for you. He's going to educate you. He's going to teach you how to think. Here it is, the components of godliness. He's going to teach you to think about things the way he does, not the way the world does. Which, by the way, just turn in your Bible just for a moment. Let me just show you this concept, Romans chapter 12. If you'll just flip over there real quickly, it's not on the PowerPoint, I'm just, I'm just setting all of this up here. Romans chapter 12, and this is really where the education starts, and so before you get the first little bit of wisdom from your father, you're going to go through what we call a sonship checkpoint. And in verse 1, he says this, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, and look at this this exhortation in verse 2, and be not conformed to this world. The thinking that you're going to learn is not anything the world has ever become familiar with. 
this new thinking, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. And that means this new way of thinking is actually going to transform us from the inside out. And so when we get this new thinking generated in us, that is going to cause us to now do th not only do different things, but do them in a different way, a way our Father would do it. Because He is really reproducing His life in us is what's being done here. And when we learn to think like He does and do things His way, we're then qualified to labor with Him in what He is doing. And that's going to that's gonna make for a fabulous eternity because that's actually what you're going to be doing. Now, I know that's old hat for, for, for most of the folks that are listening on the Internet and that are seated here, but let me just use that now to segue us in because as we start in Romans chapter 12, the very first thing you're asked to do in those first two verses is to make a commitment to your Heavenly Father and to His business. This is another opportunity to say, yes, this is what I want. And if, you, and if you can do that and pass that checkpoint of verses 1 and 2, then the first thing that he teaches you right out of the box is that whenever a church group meets together, that you're supposed to look at that group as a body. And that every single person that's meeting there is a member of a single body. And then he teaches you how a real body functions, that there's a hand and an eye and a foot, and they all have different jobs. And because, and he'll even talk about, because, you know, the eye can't say to the hand, because you're not the eye, you're not of the body. Because the hand is not only a part of the body, it's a necessary part. Because he says this, if the whole were an eye, where is the hearing? See, if every body was the same, and so you know what you have? You have one body with many members, and then, and I'm going to reteach this, but in these verses, he begins in verses 3 through 8, he begins to introduce you, to you the basic concepts of how a body of believers are supposed to function together as a single body. Listen to this carefully. And it doesn't matter how big your group is or how small it is. It doesn't matter how long you've been around or how short you've been around. Until those four basic body attributes and those seven offices are up and running in your group, you are not a church in the eyes of your Father. You're just another group of people getting together. Because that group functions as a body. By the way, that's the name that we're called corporately, is it not? We're the body of Christ. And Christ, what is his, what, what's his position in the heavenlies? He's called the what? The head of the body. And so all of that is not terminology by accident. That's all pointing to what we are. And so that's, that's a piece of wisdom that your Father is giving you. And what He's teaching you in these next two components right here are things that comprise His wisdom. And then there's a way that we look at each other in this body, and, and, and the major attribute is selflessness. That it's going to be not what's in it for me, but what can I do to make sure that this body functions the way it's supposed to. The next part was found in verses 9 to 16, in which we saw godly loving kindness for each other. And that's the way those members of the body are supposed to feel about each other. I want to warn you about this. The world understands what selflessness is. And we could look around at people who maybe even didn't believe in God and see what we would call a selfless act. Now, what I'm about to tell you is critical. It is the difference. Because someone would look at someone that's maybe outside of Christianity and say they do all these good things, and they are selfless, and they do exhibit loving kindness. But the selflessness and the loving kindness and the other things that you would name are not generated from what your Heavenly Father has done in them it is generated in their own best efforts, which means it's the product of their flesh. And your Heavenly Father is not talking about what you can generate. He abhors that. To Him, that 
is an abomination. And do you know why? Because that is you trying to produce your own sanctification. You can no more do that than you can save yourself. Those are things you can't do. And do you know why? Because you're not perfect. So your Heavenly Father has to do something to fix the fact that you can't save yourself. And what does He do? He sends His Son. And not only does He justify you unto eternal life, He sanctifies you as well, which is the power to enable you to produce a righteousness in your everyday life that He is well pleased with and is acceptable to Him. And because of that, these things are generated not by my best effort. The Bible says I'm supposed to be selfless, and so, okay, I might as well just do this thing here because that's how we approach the Bible. We read something in the Bible where it talks about endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ, and maybe we're having a discussion group. And so I would look over at Francis, and I would say, Francis, tell me how we can endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. There's only one right answer to that question. Although in a normal group, you would get a dozen different answers. One of them would say, well, when hard times are happening, we don't complain, we endure hardness. And someone else would say, well, it means that when those hard times are in our life, that we don't shy away from them, but we face them right on. And, and, and someone else would say, yeah, and, uh, and we would depend on the Lord to get us through it. And that's all very general talk, and it sounds very good. None of that is the answer to the question. The answer to the question of how do I endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ is this and this alone. There is doctrine sitting in your Bible that once you understand that doctrine, now watch this process. The first thing you have to do is understand it. Once you understand that doctrine, and then you believe that doctrine, those are the things that constitute godly thinking. Once that is done, you come along and you implement the doctrine into your behavior. That is godly living. Once you do that, in other words, you understand the doctrine, you believe the doctrine, and now you actually put it into practice in your life the Bible then does something nothing else can do uh, in a book form. We say this is a living word, right? Here's how it's living. When you do that, the Spirit of God that you received the day you got saved takes that word that you now understand and believe and have begun to implement into your conduct and behavior, and it does something that is, that is called in your Bible, it effectually works in your inner man to produce something. In, in this particular case, how, how are we going to endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ? There's only one way. Is it by... Well, we'll do like the British, and we'll have a stiff upper lip. Is that how you endure hardness? I'm just going to, by, by the sheer act of my will, I'm going to not complain. I'm going to endure this hard circumstance. That's not it either. The only way that you endure hardness is when the doctrine that produces that is understood and believed and acted on. That's how that works this is not about us looking at the bible saying you need to be patient loopy so how and so and loopy goes i, I just got to be more patient isn't that how we all did it in fact as a preacher i can remember standing up and preaching sermons saying we need to be more patient but the truth of the matter is the kind of patience your father is talking about is not the kind generated by the world and it is not the kind generated by our flesh that patience is generated by this word effectually working in your inner man. That's what makes this a different kind, and that's, what, that's the different thinking here. It's not, I can work this up myself. If you could, you wouldn't need the word to work in you. That, that would be ridiculous. 
This is the point we've always missed. We've been talked to like, like preachers are motivational speakers, and they've been telling us all the things we were supposed to do, but to give us the doctrine that produces that, we never got. There is a specific doctrine written in your Bible that when you're going through difficult circumstances, this doctrine produces patience. And this doctrine produces endurance. And this doctrine produces comfort. And this doctrine produces long-suffering. And this doctrine produces strength. And this, do-, do you see what I'm saying? And if you don't have those doctrines working in you, The best you're going to get is what you can work up in your own energy. But you know what we do? Because that's all we know is out there. Because no one talks about this issue. We just go, well, the Lord really helped me with that. The truth of the matter is, the Lord didn't help you work it up out of your flesh at all. He has one way to produce those things in you to take this Word and work it in your inner man and transform you by the renewing of your mind. Remember, we just read that in Romans chapter 12, verse 1. This is the process. This escapes us somehow, that we think that by our own efforts we're just going to be good enough. And I'm just going to be honest with you as I can be. There are going to be people who show up at the judgment seat of Christ who have worked their entire life tirelessly, And they have sacrificed. And they have done everything they can possibly, physically, or mentally do to do the right thing. And because it's all been done in their own energy, all of that is going to be burned up as wood, hay, and stubble at the judgment seat of Christ. Why am I telling you this? Because I don't want that to be what happens to us. But when this gets produced out of the doctrine, in other words, what's written on these pages, the doctrine and the exhortations, when those things are understood and believed and put into our life, and that's what we're basing our actions on, your father looks at that and says, you didn't produce that. I produced that. And when that goes to work in you, you know what it does? It conforms you to the image of His Son. And when it conforms you to the image of His Son, it brings Him glory. This is not about what you worked up. It's about what He produced in you from something you didn't do. It's from something He did. That is all the difference in the world. So you may, look, can I say it like this? One person can do a very noble deed for their own reasons, and maybe they're even good reasons. Your father looks at that and says, not good enough. Another person does the exact same thing, but he does it because the doctrine worked in his inner man. And your father looks at that and says, that I am well pleased with. That's why the process is important. Doing things his way. It's not important to go, hey, we both did a good deed. What's the difference? There's a big difference. One of those got done in the energy of your flesh, and Romans 8 says, they that are in the flesh, what? Cannot please God. God hates that. That's what Christ provided for, by the way, along with your salvation, is for there to be some way for you to live other than your best effort in the energy of your flesh. So when you do it his way, see, it's that that process is that important. Are you getting what I'm saying to you? Look, I know we took some time on this, but this is critical because our whole life we just we read things in the Bible and it would be like saying, Well, how do I think I need to do that? You're asking the wrong question. The question is, where's the doctrine that produces that? And once you find that doctrine, what is your job? Understand it, believe it, and put it into your conduct and behavior. And you know what you're doing when you do that? You're living out of what your heavenly Father produced. Do you think He likes that? You better believe He does. So do you see? I, I know this seems like a, 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 almost an argument in semantics, but it's not. This is the critical difference. 
Don't live for 40 years serving Jesus so you can watch all of it burn to smoke at the judgment's refining fire. Yeah, you'll be saved, but you'll have nothing at the end. And do you know why your father wants to transform you with this doctrine? Because he has a goal in mind for you. What is that goal? To, okay, to labor with him. And in order to really labor with him to its fullest extent, what does he have to make out of you? Uh, okay, I heard three things. What do you, what do you, what do you, uh, uh, to be conformed to him, your son. Well, educated. And what did you say? Same thing. She's, okay, well, now you do. Okay. No, I'm, I'm just picking on Linda. All right, look. That, you know what he's doing? He, he, is, he is producing the character of his son in you. He is co educating you so that you'll be conformed to the image of his son. He wants his wisdom written on your heart and put on display in your life. You, does that make sense? This is what, and, and, and so here's how Paul calls it. What is that final goal? To bring you unto a perfect man, that you may stand perfect and complete in him. And when he's talking about perfect there, he's not talking about you'll never do anything wrong again. What is that perfect, what is that perfect talking about? Yeah, it's talking about a completion or a fullness. That everything that he has to teach you, you have now understood and believed and you begin to implement it into your conduct and behavior. That's his goal, to bring us to that place. And there's only one thing that will get you there. So when a man who's been pretty successful in business says to me, I, I, I mean, you know, that sounds really good, but really... I don't know that I need sonship because I already make pretty good decisions. I'm thinking, as far as the world goes, you probably do. But as far as your father goes, you haven't made a right one yet. Sorry, but there it is. Now, I get to say that here, and you've been with me long enough, you get it, right? Most places, that gets you kicked out. But this is the reality of it. So what am I describing here? I'm describing the process that he does from the very beginning to start you on the road to becoming that perfect man. To get you conformed to the image of his son. So when he talks about selflessness, what do you know? That is not you trying to be selfless. What is that? That selflessness is produced out of a doctrine that starts in Romans 12, 3 through 8. And when that doctrine works in your inner man, it generates the very start of godly selflessness. And you say, is that different from the world's selflessness? Indeed it is. And then you're going to get godly loving kindness generated in you. We went through these verses. You know these. And so that's different from the world's loving kindness. And, that, and those all fall under a category of wisdom. Now, there's a lot of subcomponents. And then you come to the next one where he is dealing with us, not just in our relationship with, as a body or our relationship to other saints or saved people, but now in 12, 17 to 21, he is talking about our relationship to our enemies. And then we learn some more components or major attributes of godly love in that we learn to be long-suffering and meek. And there's a reason, by the way, I, I wanted to def I define those terms for you. Meekness is not an absence of strength or cowardice. Meekness is the setting aside of something for the purpose of achieving that which is of greater value. That is meekness. And so when you get, the, and by the way, you get these things generated in you in the context of your enemies, but your father means for you to have those major attributes up and running in you, and that eventually you're not just going to apply them to your enemies, but you're going to apply that to who? To everybody. See, you learned this one in the context of a local church or assembly. 
You learn this one in the context of how I treat other saints. You learn this one in the context of how I deal with my enemies. You learn this one in the context of human government. You learn this one, the one we're finishing up today, in the context of how you treat your neighbor. And then we found out what our neighbor was. Your neighbor is not just the person that lives next door to you. Your neighbor is the person you happen to be around at any given time. Right now, Francis is Ron's neighbor. They don't live anywhere near each other. But that's who he's... That's who he is in close proximity to. And when he talks about your neighbor, he's not just talking about saved people. He's also talking about lost people. So it doesn't matter if they're saved or lost. You have an obligation about what you're going to do there. And if you do, if you understand that doctrine and believe it and put it into your conduct and behavior, you are being conformed to the image of Christ. That's what your father is after. And so let's, so let's let now, now that we've done that, let me finish this up in the few minutes we've got left. So Romans 13, you know what? Take me all the way over to Romans 13, 8, please, Trent. And what it's going to do is it's going to highlight the last half of the verse, Romans 13, 8. Oh, back up. Oh, no, you know what? Give me one, go forward one, and let's start right there. Paul's going to come along and talk about the law. In fact, you want to just read this, but we don't have it in order in the PowerPoint. So go back to your Bible, look at Romans chapter 13, and let's read these verses, and then we'll have a jumping off place for this. Romans chapter 13. Romans chapter 13, and look with me in verse 8. Owe no man anything but to love one another, for he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. And then, look what Paul does in the next verse. For this, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt covet, and if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Well, look back up at the end of verse 8. For he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. And then he comes along and gives you five of those ten commandments. Why in the world is Paul bringing up the law? Because you all know how Paul feels about following the law to try to live for God or be saved, right? Not going to happen. Well, first of all, the, pro the problem is not with the law itself. And, uh, and by the way, if you have your notes, there's a note taker here, and you can fill this in. I don't think we got this last time, so it'll be a blank on your note taker. There is nothing wrong with the law. It is spiritual, and it represents the righteousness of God. What's wrong with trying to keep the law to be saved or to, to be sanctified? What's wrong with that? Yeah, the problem is us. The problem's not the law. The problem is us. So give me that second one, please, Trent. We're exhorted to produce righteousness that is acceptable to God while we're still living in these fleshly bodies. Every preacher says that. We're supposed to live for God. We're supposed to be holy. We're supposed to be righteous. We're supposed to be spiritual. We have all kinds of ways that we say it. And the truth is, though, you're not going to do that by keeping the law because it's, that's not able to be done. I, uh, okay, now let, let's see. Do you have, what's next? Oh, this is examples of that. What shall we say? Is the law sin? God forbid. Paul says, no, the problem's not with the law. Here's the next one. Uh, Wherefore the law is holy and the commandment holy and just and good. See, the pro that's my point. The problem is not with the law. Are we supposed to produce righteousness? Give me that next um, Give me that next one, Romans 6, 13. Neither yield your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. So, yeah, we are called upon to be righteous, and we are uh, called upon to produce a righteousness that God is uh, accepting of. Now, with that being said, I sure hope this next one is Romans Ha-ha, <laughs> okay. Well, no, 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 that's fine because it's still in your note taker. And if you have these blanks, you need to fill in. The only kind of love that can produce that kind of righteousness is our Father's love. And look, you see these attributes up here? We're talking about selflessness and loving kindness and long-suffering and meekness and, and uh, the submission to the ordinance of God under human government. And we're about to see some sayings. But, and then all of those subcomponents that go with that. Listen, all of that is what makes up how your heavenly father feels about things. That's the attributes of his love. 
The only thing that can produce a righteousness that he will accept is the attributes of his love produced his way in you. That's what he is after. All right, now give me that next one. If you do not know those attributes of love, if you're unaware of them, then you cannot live like your father. It's impossible to do that. And so now, let's see, what do I have next? Romans 8, 3. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh. Whose flesh? Yeah, everybody's flesh. The law could, let me ask you this. Did the law have power to produce righteousness? No. No. What did the law do? Okay, but I'm saying, does it give you the power no, to produce you righteousness? You That's right. What does the law do? It doesn't empower you. It just demands it. That's all it does. Grace, on the other hand, guess what? Gives the power to produce righteousness. Something the law couldn't do. See, what the law depended on, what's the power source of the law? Well, I mean, no, no, but that's not the power source. The law itself is holy. What gives it? Yeah. See, what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh. The, the law depends on your flesh. See? But your flesh, can it, can it be perfect? No. And what do you say about the law? If you offend in one point, what? Ah, guilty of all. That's exactly right. So you see, it, the law is weak through the flesh. So it, because the law couldn't do it, couldn't produce that righteousness, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. In other words, he took on real human flesh. He didn't say he was sinful. He said in the likeness of that flesh. And for sin, condemned flin, sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us. And here's the important phrase that follows. Who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Let's talk about that phrase. You understand what walking after the flesh is. It's you trying to do the thing you're supposed to do in your own energy, right? Now you're introduced to a different concept. But no, no, back me up. This concept of walking not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Walking after the Spirit. You know, just by the way it's phrased, it's the opposite of walking after the flesh. If walking after the flesh is you producing it, walking after the Spirit must be what? Him producing it, right? In fact, something that the Spirit itself is very involved in. Let me ask you, who was it that inspired those scriptures to be written? Yeah, it was the Spirit, was it not? Holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Remember that? All Scripture is given by inspiration. That was the job of the Spirit. And now that you have this, this, this Bible, this written Word of God, now let's go back to what we understand over here. You know what the Spirit is doing? He is leading you. A while ago someone said education. You know what the Spirit is doing? He is leading you through to be educated into how to think like your Father and to do things His way. He is producing the components of godliness in you, but He's not doing it magically or automatically. Tom doesn't just wake up one day and suddenly he goes, Wow, I just know a bunch of stuff I never heard before in my life. You know how those things get in him? From the Word. And that's the job of the Spirit, is to lead us. Remember Romans 8, 14? For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Those things, those things are coming right out of the Word. And so when, that's, when, when that is being done, when that's being accomplished in you, you're not walking after the flesh. You're walking after the Spirit. That's what that phrase, because, okay, now look, I'm going to say this, and, and you'll understand it more as we go. A lot of times when the Bible is talking about walking after the Spirit, it is not concentrating on the person of the Spirit as much as it is the work that the Spirit is doing. 
You're going to see this. I'm going to show it to you in just a moment. This is the work that the Spirit is doing in taking us through this. So it's not like I'm walking after the Spirit and all I have to do is just kind of figure out what He's doing. It's already here what He's doing. We're going to follow after that. Because, by the way, if you're walking after someone, what are you doing? Yeah, you're following them. And you know what? We know exactly what that is because he is leading us. All right, so having said that, now let's see. So this, um, I, because I got something else in here. We did that deal that if you cannot, okay, here we go. In Romans 8, Paul emphasized the way of how we fulfill the righteousness of the law, and that's by the Spirit. The next one, in Romans 13, Paul is emphasizing the nature of how we fulfill the righteousness of the law, and that is by the very components of your Father's love being generated in you. That's how that gets done. Now, i gotta, I got to hurry because we have a lot that we haven't done and we need to get this done. So let me take you, Romans 13, 8. Oh, no man anything but to love one another, for he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. Do you see that? How, do you, how, do, how would a man fulfill the law? By having these attributes of godly love up and running in him. Because if those things are functioning in you, this is important. If these things are generated and functioning in you, you will automatically fulfill the righteousness of the law without trying to keep the law. See that? It's not about you trying to keep the law. It's about your father putting something in your inner man that causes your behavior now to be perfectly in line with the righteousness of the law. Do you know what that means? If all of this was working in us, you wouldn't need a law. You'd just do the right thing. And I mean as your heavenly father sees it. Because he knows if he just tells us, you guys need to keep the law... We're sunk. But if he says, I'll produce something in your inner man that produces righteousness, that's the point that I was trying to get to with that. Okay. Um, so, this is going to bring us to Romans 13, 9. For this, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet. And if there be any other commandments, briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbors thyself. What we're going to see, and this is more complete in your notes, but what we're going to see is that everything in the law is actually broken down into two commandments. Remember, they came to Jesus, and they tried to trick him, and they said, what is the great commandment in the law? And Jesus said, well, there's two. <laughs> Not the answer they were thinking. He said, there's two. The first one uh, was, love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind. Remember that? Here's that one. That's the commitment to your father and his business. And all the rest of these, and then he says, and all the rest of the law is in this. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Because once you start doing this, do you know what you're doing? You're exhibiting the love that fulfills the law. That's how that gets done. So give me this next one, Trent. All of these five, look, all he did is he listed the last five. He didn't list the first five because the first three pertain to God. The last two pertain to the Sabbath and to parents. But when we're talking about your neighbor, you're talking about more than your parents. You're talking about everyone that you're around, right? So the last five are the ones that actually fit the bill on love thy neighbor. Okay, give me that next one because we really got to move through this. No, give me the next one. It'll be a Matthew passage. But when the Pharisees had heard that he had put the Sadducees to silence, they were gathered together, and one of them, which was a lawyer, asked him a question, tempting him and saying, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said to him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law, and he didn't stop there, and the prophets. Now there's something to know about that. But I want to show you that what he had done back there in the Sermon on the Mount is he had actually began to correct 
the corrupted doctrine that the Pharisees had begun to teach to the nation of Israel. Show me what is that next one. I'm just showing you the love thy neighbor's thyself. Give me the next one. Okay, that's not going to do it. All right, just wait right there and I'll catch up. Here's what he's going to do. He's going to come along and he's going to say, you have heard it said by them of old time. Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. Wait a minute. You already know what the law says about your enemy. What did the law say? Ah, see how they turn that? You have heard it said by them of old time, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. But I say unto thee, Love your enemy. Do good to them which despitefully use you. You remember all of that? Remember, we love to talk about this. What do you say to the believing remnant? If a man smite thee on the right cheek, what? Why is he talking like that? What is he doing? He's not just, he, so, so he's promoting pacifism. That's not what he's doing. He's talking to the believing remnant about a situation in where they're supposed to put something on display that the world really doesn't understand. But they're not doing it because they just want to be sweet people and get along. That's not why they're doing it. They're doing it because there's a particular doctrine that has been worked, that's supposed to work in them, that is equipping them for their eternity when they're on this earth. And when we get this doctrine from Paul, this is not just something so that you'll just get along with everybody. Not that that's a bad thing, but that's the way the world does it. Why can't we all just get along? Well, I'll tell you why. Because we don't all have the doctrine effectually working in us. Because until that happens, it's not going to happen. We're being equipped for eternity here. And, and that's, that's the, the thing that's being done. Right, I'm just about to run out of time on this session, so let me skip over here. Give me this next one, Romans 13, 9. There you go. It says, and, and, uh, and, and if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying. And he said briefly comprehended, not briefly stated. Because what he's saying is, yeah, it's briefly comprehended. In other words, no, you don't have all the details of every law that was ever written by saying thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. But when you boil it all down, if you obey that commandment, guess what? That's the decision you would have made in all those circumstances. So, no, not all the details are given to you in that one brief statement. But he is saying it is comprehended in this saying. Now, wait a minute. When he says... Thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, and it's all comprehended in thou shalt love thy neighbors thyself. Wait a minute, was it, was it that back in the law? It was. Then why does he call it a saying? Why didn't he say it's briefly comprehended in, comprehend in this commandment? Well, first of all, this is Romans 13, and guess what? You don't have any commandments. Paul's not calling it a commandment for you. It's a saying. And by the way, what is a saying? Give me that next one because we're going to define this. A saying is something that is said, chiefly something that's been said by a more or less distinguished person, an apothetum or a dictum. Yeah, I think I have another one. Give me this next one. Oh, yeah, apothetum. I, I, I wanted to show you that's just a terse saying. It just, you know, like briefly comprehended. That's what he was saying, a pointed saying. And a saying is something that is commonly said or a proverb. Well, you know what? They did say those things a lot. That's why Jesus said, You have heard it been said by them of old time, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. Why did he say you have heard it said? Because it was a saying. Everybody understood it. Everybody had heard it. So you know what Paul is going to do? He's going to come along and he's going to give us a couple of sayings that we're now going to put on our list of things that we're going to add to the attributes that's supposed to be at work in us. And so let me catch up to where we are in the notes here. Oh, yeah, see, I did give it to you in Matthew. You've heard it said, and give me the next one, Trent, because I've already done these. They made the word of God through, of none effect because they corrupted that law. Okay, give me that next one. Ah, no, give me the next one because I did that one already, and I did that one already, and I did that one already. And there it is in the law in Leviticus 19, love thy neighbors thyself, I'm the Lord. Do you see it was back in the law, so give me, give me the next one. All right, so the two sayings for us in the dispensation of grace contained in Romans chapter 13, verses 8 through 10 are this. Number one, owe no man anything but to love one another. There's the first saying. The second saying is, love worketh no ill to its neighbor. So when you're making a decision about what you're going to do with the person that you're around, 
you're going to have to ask yourself the question that if I'm really going to take this godly thinking, if I'm going to understand it and believe it and then implement it into my behavior, then the thing I'm about to say or the thing I'm about to do, does it work ill to my neighbor? And I should have a definition in there, Trent, about ill. Do I, do I have that on the PowerPoint? I should have a definition for that sitting in there. If you don't see it, no? Okay. When he talks about love worketh ill to its neighbor, it means that on purpose it is doing something to the detriment or harm of them. And love doesn't do that. So now what I'm going to do is I've got to end the session because I have 35 seconds left. I'm going to show you how this works. So here's the questions that you would ask about these sayings. Does this decision reflect my commitment to my father and to his business? Does this decision reflect my commitment? Uh, I'm sorry. Is this decision selfish or selfless? We could go right down the line. Give me the next one. Is this decision made out of sincere loving kindness for this person or for this cause? Uh, is this decision... Uh, does this decision demonstrate the value and esteem that I have for them? I mean, you know how this works. We've been through this before, right? So what you're going to be doing is you're going to, and when you get to the end, you know what you're going to be asking yourself? The last question you're going to ask yourself now is what? Do, what? what? Yeah, does this decision work ill? To, is that what you said, boo? Does this decision work ill to my neighbor see all you're doing is going down the line with everything you've been taught do you know why you're doing that process because that's the very way your father does it you're being taught to do it his what this is the process he goes through so when he's thinking about what he's doing this is exactly the thought process that is in his mind but he is God so it's not like he has to stop and figure it out. It's who he is. But you're being taught that. And it's not automatic with us. So in the beginning, we go through that process. Does everybody kind of understand that? I know you're being introduced to a lot of concepts here. Okay, so we're going to take a break. And when we come back, we have a totally different subject matter. And I've got notes to hand out to you. So we'll...